So in Hua Xian Bay, you still find Shanghai. There are basically fakes. There are reproductions of uh, established brands. I'll give you an e example because this is a, a contemporary sort of uh, Shanghai smartwatch running on an Android uh, system. The reproductions were really the items that were sought after by people who could not afford the the real thing. The most similar things to the ideas of Shanghai in the West is the idea of Robin Hood. They try to empower the poor with the latest advancement in technology. Sanzai and the maker movement and the startups, they are very alike. They are very much share the same spirit. Even though they are not from big company, they feel powerful. When, you, when they talk about people who left the factories and copied a phone, well, that was kind of like the open source stuff that wasn't open source. They just sort of like, oh, the schematics are on the desk. I will conveniently help myself to them, make a photocopy, and then leave the factory with them, right? You know, was that stealing or was that open source, right? In, in the West, it's called theft, right? In, out here, it's called sharing. So this is a clip from uh, Shenzhen, which was a recent documentary from Wired Magazine. Um, why I showed you this, because I really wanted to keep that in mind as we proceed through the slides. Um, it's kind of this philosophy that we would actually see in a lot of other sectors than just uh, digital products, per se. So, um, yeah. So the format of this presentation would be a lot of pictures that I've actually scored from Instagram, um, a lot of my friends, and so this is how it's going to be. They, I'm going to give attribution to the users of the Instagram users. If they have a website, they're going to be on the left. And most of the pictures are going to be Instagram frames. Um, so just to start with, uh, my name is Saurav. Um, I work for Frog as a design technologist uh, and an interaction designer. As Alex mentioned, I'm actually from India. Um, have been living in Shanghai. Um, I think this is a picture that you have to stereotypically show when you're from Shanghai, some of the tallest buildings. Um, so I've been living in Shanghai for almost two years now, um, working for Frog at the same time. Um, so how many of you actually know what is Frog? Can I see some hands? OK, quite a few. Wow, OK, great. So I don't have to actually go in depth. But anyways, let me mention it again. So Frog is an innovation and design consultancy. Um, it was actually founded 50 or 60 years back, for those of you who don't know, um, in the Black Forest in Germany, um, in an age in post-war design age about functionality, where form follows functionality. There was our founder who said, form follows emotion, and things like that. And so it is, came out as an industrial and product design company, but then over time, we have transitioned towards digital innovation. And now, as we speak, we're a design strategy firm, which basically works with clients a lot uh, but from a consumer standpoint. So we're trying to tell our clients, like, hey, I mean, yeah, your profitability is important, but um, trying to give them, scope them out for a longer run rather than like a short uh, success, so to say. Um, apart from that, I also have my own art collective, so to say. It's, it's a bit of a, um, how do I say it best? But we do design criticism. Uh, we call it Automato Farm. We have, I have two more other partners in crime, who is, one of them is an Italian ex-frog, ex -frog, one of my colleagues, and uh, Matthew, who is from RCA London. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief, I'm going to go through it very quickly, but um, some of the projects that we do at Automato are something like, just to give you an understanding of what we do, actually do there. Um, we make the, we are always interested in like smart, uh, simple products, which are going to be, well, not smart, but today not smart, but simple, small things, mundane objects, which are going to be smart in probably near future. Uh, we are always interested in um, we are we are basically like scrutinizing smart and intelligent, so to say. Uh, we try to go deep, so we make fans that can go on Mechanical Turk and ask for decisions from people to make decision choices. Also, we make things that are designed to be politically biased, so to say. So the plugs that you are seeing on the right-hand side are called political plugs that are inherently designed to be democratic, monarchist, or tyrannic in their power distribution, so to say. We're just like trying to say the fact that design is not, or technology is not really um, unbiased, as Alan mentioned before, uh, building on top of that. So we really try to focus on those kind of things uh, at Automato. Um, just to brag a little bit more, uh, these are a few of my desks uh, at office workshop, and I also have like my little tiny little shop. So when I'm not making or working for Automato or Frog, 
I also do my own things uh, where I make things also a little bit more, again, same, critical, so to say. Um, one of the projects that I'm, yeah, on the left-hand side is called Conditional Lover. So it's basically a machine um, that automates your dating profile. Uh, it's not a bot. It's not a software bot. It's actually a physical robot um, that kind of works like the whole software interface in itself. But it was just to say that um, how you become binary over time using these systems. And surprisingly, people came and asked, hey, are you going to sell this or like produce it? I'm like, that was the point, not to sell it. Um, so now, going back uh, on the topic today that I'm going to talk about, um, features on the streets. Uh, actually, it should be a little bit, I realized, and features from the streets and not just features on the streets, right? Um, it's kind of interesting to see uh, the fact that how companies have evolved in time. Um, most of the times, mobility companies specifically have always stood themselves apart and always fascinated, being fascinated and being the unanimous agents by segregating themselves from the whole community by making their um, technology, so to say, a little bit closed, harder for people to tweak. Um, what we see in Shanghai, for example, what we have seen is kind of the opposite because it's very recent that people or Asian markets have been exposed to four-wheelers that everyone can afford and things like that. Till that, people had to go and find their own solutions in terms of mobility and small businesses and things like that. So a few people at Frog, we actually took this liberty to do a small research piece, and this is a part of it which I'm going to talk about. Um, the whole ball game of how it actually works and what are these different people who exist out there, um, what sort of businesses they're actually doing on this hacked, modified vehicles, so to say. Um, so as we always fight in this traditionally established design world, uh, when it, we have this nomenclature fight of like design fiction, science fiction, uh, speculative design, critical design, all this stuff, those people out there are actually kind of naive about all of these. They're not educated engineers or designers, and they somehow make it happen so to say. They are not into this whole debate. For them, they don't even realize what they're actually doing. Uh, it's a practice that has actually trickled over time through our generations and practice. Um, and they do it pretty well, goddamn well. And one of the things that sometimes it's hard for us to understand and something because when we talk about making something for a global market, we oftentimes don't take into consideration the cultural differences. Um, and Cultural difference is just one thing. Um, how does a smart car developed in Silicon Valley works in the roads of China, for example, or India, where there are a lot of cows on the street? Um, it's, it's kind of interesting um, because at work we have a lot of uh, colleagues who are from China as well, from Shanghai locally as well, and when we have clients who are Chinese, I'm going to give you a specific example of what happens. Uh, we always struggle to actually claim um, or make them understand um, what is design because our design thought process that we are actually kind of enforcing on them um, are coming from the West, so to say, like the European standards or the American standards, and what they want is completely different. For example, a phone company recently we worked with, uh, when we first proposed the designs, they were like, they're like, no, 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 this is, this is not going to work in the market because this is very not symmetric and it's not something that people would like. We'll, they're like they like symmetry, they like circle, um, curve shapes and shades of pink, and so to say, uh, and gold. So there was like a debate, um, and for us it was kind of interesting to understand that, like from where it is actually coming from and things like that. Um, and these are the bits and pieces that we would actually look further in the slides a little bit more. But touching back on um, what actually Alan emphasized as well, um, we as designers actually kind of now has more responsibilities uh, than we have ever imagined or feel like to have. Things should happen, you know? Like uh, things go the other way, haywire, that we have never planned for. Um, one of the examples is like in China, um, and not just Shanghai, in whole China, the sharing economy is thriving. Uh, you have shared bikes and a lot of other amenities that you can share. 
So when first one of the shared bikes came in into the market, in the road, um, it was a company called Mobike. It was a startup, uh, which actually now recently launched in Italy. Uh, it was an engineering marvel. Like, there, there was no belt. Uh, there was no uh, gears. It was like transmission, like cars. Um, but it was an engineering marvel. Their intention was very noble. They wanted to launch or reduce pollution on the streets. So they released bikes that people can go and have. But over a course of two months, 20 other startups joined the game. And they started producing even cheaper bikes. And what happened eventually is government has to clamp down on bike startups um, in the fact that now they're causing more pollution in the iron industry. Because when you have more demand to produce the cycles and the frames, one of the unintentional causes, now you are causing more demand from the factories to produce, manufacture them, um, and you're burning fuel, fossil fuels to do so. And so you're actually creating more pollution in terms of by thinking that you're actually reducing pollution. So these are the unintentional causes, and sometimes we get to overlook. Um, and then we started seeing things like this now, uh, because there are so many sharing bikes everywhere. Nobody cares about them. They're just like, yeah, like a piece of paper. Um, I just, I don't know why I wanted to show this one, but I just really wanted to show this picture. It was like one of these things uh, outside uh, one, of our, one of my friend's house. It's like, this is how a typical day looks like in Shanghai for those who, who've... How many people actually have been in China? Can I see some few hands? Like, just, okay, cool. So yeah, anyways. Um, okay. As I was mentioning before, um, it's been very recent that Asian markets have been uh, introduced to four-wheelers and people can afford them. Scooters actually do move a lot of mass in, um, in Asia in general, not just China, Cambodia, Thailand, India. Uh, not just scooters, two-wheelers, three-wheelers, motorized, unmotorized, man-powered. Um, their sole purpose, as we assume, is to take you from place A to place B. Um, sometimes, um, most of the times in urban areas, um, it's not really hard to see more than four or five people in one motorcycle or scooter uh, there. Um, and then oftentimes um, what happened in Asia, because there were no cars or not such a huge demand and not everyone can afford them, the cities were not designed for cars, so to say, as they were designed, say, for example, in Europe. Um, so there are small alleyways, so literally, if you really have to go to someone's house, which is, you have to go through an alleyway, you have to walk, say, for example, 500 more meters, you have to drop your car somewhere else, you have to find a parking spot. So those things were not taken into consideration while designing the places, but scooters, for example, or two-wheelers in general can basically navigate those veins. Um, it's true that there hasn't been so much of uh, development, so to say, as we'd expect, into wheeler industries. But there are people who are actually working on that, uh, both from a technological standpoint and from a service standpoint. So the one, the picture that you are seeing here right now, I don't know if you're familiar with Gogoro. It's a Taiwanese startup, um, which actually has released really good scooters, uh, shared scooters in Berlin, I guess. Um, I saw, I, I was glad to see one of them when I was in Berlin last time, but it's interesting. But also, like, from a techno, this is more of a service take on two-wheelers. There are technological things, companies like Honda and things like that, they are actually working on that. But it's, we have to agree, it's, it's slow pace. It's not the ones like car industry, so to say. Um, but yeah, there, there's, again, our assumption of two-wheelers just being a carrier for you or a transport motive to take you from place A to place B just doesn't end there in Asia. It's like there's, there's, there's a lot more to do it. People are doing businesses. They, it, it, it is a part of their life, so to say. Uh, for, just to give you an example, um, during our research when we were going out and asking people around, we found that um, migrant workers coming from small cities when they're coming to the metropolis, they actually go out um, and try different jobs on two-wheelers. So they'll go out and they'll become a uh, they'll carry, say, postal bo post boxes. Um, your, um, they'll go and fix your houses. And so these are the things they actually try on two-wheelers because it's very affordable and cheap. Um, so we basically then started thinking about, okay, okay, so let's just see what are the different businesses that actually occur uh, as, on these scooters as platforms. So what you're seeing here on the screen is basically one of our visual designers who actually designed 
some of the key components that you'd usually find on a scooter, which we'd see. Uh, but for example, like you have, a, you have a washing machine as well. So this guy goes around and basically for people who do not have, do not, do not have washing machines in their home, they just like give him some RMB and uh, he does it for you. And then you have um, food trucks, you have uh, people selling fruits and vegetables and things like that. So really started seeing these um, sort of groups of people, if I may say, um, where I started seeing the different, uh, not segregations, but like what kind of um, offerings that they provide as a service on, from these two wheelers, right? And so you, as I was mentioning before, you can see a guy who actually is transporting um, post boxes and uh, other, other things, so really, really heavy things. And for him, um, one of the things that, um, so Mr. Liang, one of the things that he does usually, he goes to the pickup point, picks the objects, loads as much as he can, so his scooter has to be really, really sturdy, so he has to actually make it that way. And then um, he goes and drops them off, and that's how his day continues. Over time, he comes back and chills out with his friends, have a smoke, but what he's really afraid of is like his um, batteries getting stolen. So he carries always two locks and one spare battery with him all the time. So clearly, the goods that he's carrying are not really important for him. Batteries are. Uh, Recycler, he's typically, you'd find them on um, three-wheelers, which they basically, they modify it themselves. Uh, they put a motor and a battery, a car battery, and probably some lights, and they just go around. So Mr. Young here, specifically speaking, travels 17 kilometers up and down, uh, 17, yeah, one way every day to actually go to neighborhoods and collect uh, recyclable materials. Um, and yeah, take it to the recycling system. But it's interesting to see because he bought a simple tricycle, and we'll talk about these structures later a little bit, uh, but he basically put the motors together by himself and because he had a specific need that nobody else could solve. And so he had to do it by himself, which is interesting. Uh, Mr. Zhang, decorator, as again, um, I was mentioning, uh, it's... Uh, so he is, on the contrary of the other two fellows, he'd have a lot more stuff on his scooter, so he'd be very flashy in advertising himself. Uh, he would, you'd typically find them, um, they're called fixers. Uh, you typically find them in intersections of roads, um, showing that what they can do. So they can, they're fixers, they can fix everything. So um, he comes and he can fix your sink, he comes and he can also fix your electric, electricity if anything is wrong in your home. Um, but yeah, he is one of these people who is actually lugging a lot of tools on board with him. On the other hand, Mr. Liu, also a person who, the merchants who also modify their uh, scooters by themselves most of the times, and you see them everywhere. It's kind of interesting to see because in China, fruit shops never close. 24-7, um, they're most of the times open, like even at midnight. I'm like, who eats fruits after midnight? But I don't know, probably they do. Um, but these are, the, these, are, these are some of the things, some of the groups of people that you'd see um, whose local businesses are actually dependent on these structures that, that they modify and evolve over time. Um, so basically then we started thinking about, so what are the different types of scooters and where do you usually find them? And as we found out, we started like mapping locations uh, where you'd actually typically see this kind of thing. So for example, the Rhino is one of those scooters that has been hacked and built for heavy lifting, for carrying goods. Is, um, and it's funnily called Rhino as well. Um, and then you have uh, the shop, which is actually carrying and selling, say, porcelain materials, plates, cups, glasses, typical things. Um, the tuk-tuk, which is, I think most of you are familiar with, is the one which carries people from point A to point B, the classical purpose. Uh, the recycler, the food carts, and all of this stuff. So um, these are, and it doesn't probably end there. I'm not saying take it as a Bible, but this is kind of the things that we have started seeing. Um, and this was a research piece that we actually did two years back, so probably things have even evolved uh, more. Um, so as, as um, I was mentioning before, why, what, how did this whole need of 
you know, the, uh, this hacking culture, so to say, evolved, right? It was, it, was, it, was, um, it was a practice that happened over time to solve a small need, uh, which big manufacturers uh, don't often try to see because their way of, traditionally speaking, in mobility industry, the way of innovation has been typically driven by technology in itself. Um, it was not really driven by um, a purpose, or so to say. It's always about technology first, and the way you segregate yourself from the others is what best you have. But in Asian markets, the demand is a little bit different. Um, it is always about the user's needs, and the minority, as I say always, minority in China is actually not the minority, it's your majority if you can capture them. So this brings us to this whole spectrum uh, and structure, this internal structure that is very bottom-up and not top-down. Um, in terms of manufacturing and production and everything, um, which is very, very local, uh, depends interdependent on each other. So for example, a person or a garage would actually modify your scooter. It's a small cottage industry, you can imagine that. So he is dependent on uh, people who are actually collecting recycled motor parts or selling or making motor parts. And local businesses would depend on the garage, for example. So these are, this is a small, microcosm of business that is actually evolving over time from bottom up. And so from quick fixes, where you basically just like say probably put a spring to actually hold your object in your scooter, to basically dedicated specific models that are actually manufactured without any brands, according to your plan and according to your needs, uh, exist. So this is like the whole spectrum you would see. Just to give you an example, um, quick fixes would be something, as I said, just something to hold. Bespoke customizations would be more like, um, say, you, it's really, really hot and sunny. You really need the uh, um, umbrella. And so just like drill a hole there and put a, two more holes to actually hold some stand and cable tie it. And that's like bespoke customization. Then local mini series, as I was saying, uh, is actually those garages that are actually dedicated to do, do that job for you if you are unable to do it by yourself. And then you have locally made parts. This is huge. Um, and it's actually not that huge in China. It's actually huge in Cambodia, apparently. Uh, it's, they have streets of basically everything. I mean, it's, you have brain orgasms if you walk on there. And it's just, you go and you'll see uh, people, it's everything, it's in there. You can basically buy, handpick everything and come. And it breaks the notion of traditional design process because you are actually thinking with objects on the streets and you see, okay, I might need that, I might need that. You bring everything, you go to your garage, you build your thing. Um, so that's, that's, that's kind of the things. And then you have, again, so from local mini series to specific mass produced models. Um, that's kind of the, the chain uh, of the production cycle and I'm, I'm hoping there's actually a lot more than that. So this begs us, brings us to the big question, where are the big brands? Um, it's not that there are no big brands. Um, it's just that also one of the things that not a lot of people are aware of them uh, because they are local. Um, they're not, say, Honda or Mercedes and things like that because when you have big brands, you have costs which uh, a class of people cannot afford. And, and that's the majority of class who are actually dependent on these bespoke customizations. Um, so cost of production is one of these things that they hugely rely upon. And so they prefer to actually score things from affordable ventures and do it by themselves. So rather than the typical, again, concentrating on that very point again, um, rather than making your engineering skills, so to say, talking for a big brands of mobility here, rather than segregating or your engineering wing and untouchable, if you make it more, so to say, open, in a way, it becomes very much accessible for other people to actually hack it, which is very counterintuitive because it doesn't help you for short run and IP protection and things like that. Um, but for a longer run, it becomes much, much more affordable and hackable. So one of the examples is um, the Honda Cub. Uh, this is I think till 2008, I think they stopped production after 2008, but till 2008, they're the highest sold in the market, highest sold to Wheeler till date. Um, and it, why am I talking about this is because Honda had a, so 
the Cub model was actually released in 1958, if I'm not wrong, after in the second post-World War Europe design where it was designed to be hacked and fixed by people on the field without, with minimum knowledge of engineering and things like that without using any special tools for it to be um, changed, so tire change or brake change and things like that. Um, and it was an internal struggle between the business wing in Honda versus the engineering versus the design because they were all struggling with this because they didn't know how, how it will actually work out um, till now when it happened and was the highest sold unit from Honda. Um, but once they opened it up, and people started using it. And now you'd see basically all these models, base models that I was talking about, um, are actually based on Honda Cub, even date. Like this is the, this is like the um, blank board where you start sketching, so to say. Um, and I think they also released another version a little bit recently um, after a Cub. So what I'm actually talking about here is tinkering as an engagement model rather than just a business model. Um, what are the benefits that would come out of it? It certainly is not short term. It takes patience to actually observe the fruits coming out of it. But it is one of those things because right now transportation um, industry is moving a lot ahead as well, very fast, very rapidly, and this is where a lot of focuses are right now, the smart cars and everything. Um, but what happens when um, you make it a little bit not exclusive? Um, that is the question. So going back from, again, not just like two-wheelers, but in an age where we don't really have to drive. What, yeah, when you really don't have to drive, what are you going to do with your smart cars? So. We cannot really see because this is one of these things that we have actually never experienced before. And so we think we have to wait for a bit to see how it evolves over time rather than making assumptions because all the assumptions that we'll make, make today will be very limited with our constrained minds and our thoughts, um, our bubbles. So yeah, with that, um, I'm going to end my presentation and that's it. <laughs>